Well, this message kind of piggybacks on the idea that we're doing some, we're going to be doing some renewal, we're going to be doing some restoration, we're going to be doing some upfit here at Calvary. Thus, we've titled the series Upfit, and I'm talking in this six-week series, I'm, I'm talking about how God the Holy Spirit comes to renovate our lives, to upfit us, to make us new. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, and we dealt with this theme text last week. He said to the Corinthian church in the fourth chapter of 2 Corinthians, the outer man is wasting away, the flesh, wasting away, but the inner man, the inner self, is being renewed day by day, indicating the Spirit's work within us is a work of constant renovation, constant renovation. So here we are a few weeks from tearing out some walls and ceilings in our lobbies for an overdue renovation. Isn't it amazing how accustomed you become to stuff? How you build something and it's new and it's fresh and you walk in and every place you look, it's, it just, it's so warm and it's so welcoming and then you just get used to it as it deteriorates. And you become used to the te deterioration. Before long, it doesn't look new and fresh anymore. As a matter of fact, it looks kind of bad, but you can't tell because you've just got used to it. I'm, I'm sure that that's not your home, but we are renovating. We've lived in our home for 23 years, and something happened to Mrs. Crabtree a little while ago, something, I don't know, it's in the water or it was a spider bite or something radioactive, but something happened and all of a sudden she kind of developed first name basis friends in suppliers all over Greensboro. And we are, we are renovating. She can tell, if you want to know, if you want to know where to find it, she can probably, she can probably help you out. And um, she has, she's, word because we just got used to it. And all you need sometimes is fresh eyes. We had a great, we had, we had a funny thing happen really over on Jefferson Road. Um, we'd been in that church, of course, for, for quite a while and it got a little bit tired and we didn't see it. So Pastor Tom walked in with a video camera on, held it about this high, I think, kind of not a dog's view, but a tall dog's view. And he just walked through our entire building and, ran, and, and shot video and then brought it to a staff meeting. And he said, you're a first-time guest walking through the doors of this church. This is what you see. We had this come-to-Jesus moment. I mean, we had, this, we had this awake. All of a sudden, something about seeing it through the lens, rather than seeing it through our own eyes, you see it different. Sometimes you just need it new and, and fresh set of eyes that will help you to see what needs to be changed because everything needs that. We're overdue here at Calvary. We've, as far as our, our lobbies and our hallways and this, all of the bottom level, except for here in the sanctuary, virtually nothing aside from a little bit of paint from time to time has been done, and so we're overdue. Are you overdue for renovation? You, not your house, you. Is it overdue in you? When was the last time you experienced Significant inner reformation or renovation or renewal, if you like. How long has it been since something substantial changed inside of you? You say, well, it's kind of a gradual process with me. Well, can you look at the last year and say, this is how I am a different creature? Can you measure in any way the ongoing renovating work of the Spirit of God. If you were a house, would you be a project for Chip and Joanna? Fixer upper? Remodeling shows are the rage. How many of you have at least watched one all the way through? Come on, be honest. Look at that. It's mixed. As many men as women. We can hang with that, can't we? I can't do as the stomach turns, but I can do that. Yeah, I, I, not that, that's not even on anymore. But I, I, can, I can do the renovations. I can do the do-it-yourself. I, I kind of, I like that. You know what I like about it? I like the endings. Everybody's happy at the ending. 
a lot of television is not happy when it ends. It leaves you with a dilemma, it leaves you with a mystery, or it leaves you know, a body in a ditch someplace. But I like television that leaves you happy. And you know what else we like about these renovating shows? It's all over in 30 minutes. And everybody who's ever done a kitchen, just they, they love to watch the renovation someplace else because it's all over in 30 minutes and it's, it speeds everything up. And when you do renovation at home, it's not like that, right? I mean, you're, you're right up to here in dust and you're ready to kill one another and it's tough. And there are a lot of renovating shows out there. Since, since this whole renovation thing began on television, the reality, whatever that is, TV, genre, uh, over 114 different shows have dealt with renovation. 114. Doesn't matter what you're renovating, just get on YouTube somewhere, somebody's done one that's just like yours. And it's great. A crew comes in and transforms a rambling wreck into a space anyone would love. And I love the before and after pictures, don't you? See, the place on the left was just great when they moved in. And 10 years later, they didn't notice that it, well, 20, 30 years later, they didn't notice that it had fallen off just a little bit. You say, oh, come on, Pastor. No, I'm telling you, this is a picture of life. We get very used to status quo. We get very satisfied with doing what we've always done. We get what we've always got. And we just decide, well, life is kind of dull. It's, it's just what it is. I shouldn't expect too much. And so we live in the house on the left. Lo and behold, Chip and Joanna show up and the house on the left becomes the house on the right. How many of you would like the Holy Spirit to show up and take the mess on the left and replace it with something wonderful on the right. This is exactly what God has in store for you and for me, being renewed day by day. The old becomes new, the good becomes better, broken is repaired or replaced. Oh, I love those shows. I love the inevitable tear. They always add an emotional. Somebody has a, there's some other deal going on that's really emotional that the fixing of the house heals. Have you noticed that? There's usually another crisis subplot and the house just makes it all better. I love that ending. I love those happy endings. I just, I smile. I, I wave when they're waving at the end of that. I, I get into, I get, get into this. And we should just begin with the ending, but nothing begins with the ending, does it? So where does it begin? It begins with a plan. It begins with a necessary vision of what should be. A necessary vision of what could be. A necessary vision today of what can be. It's a mix of dreams and drawings and deals and miracles. But it all starts with a vision. Without that vision, without that vision that says, this is what it's going to be. Unless you can see it, unless you can see it first, makeovers can go terribly wrong. Like this one. Number 2434. It's Carlsbad, California. I checked. What were they thinking? I look at this and I'm trying to figure out the balcony up there with an A-shaped roof behind it so you know it doesn't go anywhere except maybe into a little cross. What were they thinking? And when they finished it, were they proud of this? <laughs> and I was thinking, I can make fun of this as Carlsbad, California, and then I thought, I can't really make because somebody's, this might be somebody's grandma's house, but what were they thinking? So just give me some grace if it's your grandma, okay? Give me, some, give me some latitude. No, 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 no. This is wrong on so many levels, and this is life for all too many people who just let life happen to them. Where'd you get that porch? Uh, I don't know. I don't even remember them building it. Renovation begins with a proper vision of what can be. Renovation requires revisioning. Revisioning. And it all starts with that, being able to see it. 
Who's the greatest remodeler the world has ever known? It's not Chip and Joanna or the real estate brothers. I like those guys. Or Bob Vila. He's almost like the patron saint of this stuff. Who's the greatest remodeler of all times? Well, it might help you. He was known as a carpenter and greatest remodeler in the world possesses this perfect eye and perfect vision. He knows exactly what is to be made of you at your very best. If you haven't got it yet, his name is Jesus. And if you want to find the perfect vision and experience a makeover that revolutionizes your life, it starts and ends with his vision of you. One of the big problems that we have is we're always chasing our own vision. And even when we achieve it, we find it leaves us short. Because even your best dreams and your greatest visions and your deepest longings concerning your own desires, even if all of those are met, you're going to fall short of what God thought of you when he first saw you. His vision is what matters. What is it that he created you for? It starts with his vision. In the first chapter of John, we have this wonderful, this wonderful uh, narrative where Andrew finds Jesus and he goes and he finds his brother, Simon Peter. You remember that? It's in the first chapter of John, verses 40 through 42. Andrew found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus and Jesus looked at him. The way this is placed within the language of the scripture here, it's, it's, it's placed in such a way, obviously Jesus looked at people who came to them, he saw the people who were around them, but this means specifically he looked right at him. He saw him. And he said, you're Simon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas. Which is Peter. Five very, very powerful words in this. You are. You shall be. You are. But you shall be. When God speaks those words over your life. It's a powerful moment. You are. You sh this is the whole project. It's bookended. You are, you shall be. You are is an honest assessment of our condition. Jesus said, you're, you're Simon, the son of John. In other words, Jesus was saying, I know who you are. God knows who you are. If you think you've been hiding from him all your life, think again. How could you do that if he's God? You can't hide from him. There's nothing that he doesn't know about you. You are. God knows you are Simon. I don't know that we know any character in the New Testament as well when it comes to their character and temperament as we do Peter. With Paul, we know his travels and we know a much deeper development of theology. But with, with Peter, we know his character. There's this tiny wedge, this little vision that we, we are given into, into history and we see Peter there and where we see him, we really see him in his humanity. Peter, I, I, and I relate to Peter because I'm, I'm like him and, and I'm not necessarily pointing out all of his better attributes. I'm an A-type um, I, I'm like Peter. Is there anyone else here who's impetuous? <laughs> There's somebody, Don, you had your hand going up before I even finished the sentence. You just went, yeah, okay, that's me. You know, you know what's coming, don't you? Yeah, impetuous, tempestuous. Don't look at your wife right now. A braggart. A-type. Over-the-top A-type. Peter's the guy who dives into shallow pools. He just does. He signs up before he knows the terms. He's got that top gun syndrome. Son, your ego's right in checks. Your body can't cash. That's, that's Peter. That's Peter. He's impetuous. 
save. If it weren't for the work of the Holy Spirit in my life, I would have a Camaro Super Sport right now. Because I've looked, and it's me. I'm okay with the Super Sport. I don't need the ZL1 and this Super Sport. It's fine with me. Just great. If you want to buy that for me, by the way. But, I'm just, I mean, you know, now if you gave it to me, I'd feel guilty and have to sell it for missions. So, I mean, I just blew the I should have been quiet. Maybe the, anyways. See, there's Peter coming out. Maybe I can fix this. No, in this day and age, Peter would have it because he wants it and because it's there and it's terms and all you have to do is sign and you can drive. Impetuous. And Peter's also, he's the, he's the working man. He's got dirt under his fingernail. He's, he's not some big city pretender. And, and I love his flaws. They're so clear to us in the scripture. He always says the wrong thing at the wrong time. No one can stick their foot in their mouth like Peter. And sometimes he just changes feet. He starts stuff he can't finish, even late, in his, even late in his walk with the Lord. And it's the garden. It's the arrest scene in the garden. And here comes the armed Roman. Here they come. Then the, the temple guard, not the Romans, I'm sorry. The temple guard has come to arrest. And so what does he do? Pulls out the sword, lops off the ear of, of Malchus, the high priest servant. He has no plan B. There's this pregnant moment where it's like, oh, Okay, what am I going to do now? Get them, boys. I mean, what, what are you going to do? He's going, no, but you love him for that. But let's just say Peter has a little problem with impulse control. He also has got life kind of figured out. He's a fisherman from a fisherman's family, a long line of fishermen. He's a doer. He's a man of Capernaum and Bethsaida. He's known in, in the, community, the fishing community that he moves in. He, he knows he's supposed to lead the family and feed the family and continue the legacy. He suffers no lack of confidence. He's got lots of it, it seems. But he possesses no real sense of his purpose or destiny. Or let me put it this way. He has no idea when he meets Jesus. God has so much in store for him. And when it all began, Peter's brother, Andrew, brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him. I see you, Peter. His vision is clear. Ours is usually clouded, but his is crystal clear. Our ability to read people is a little bit overrated. I'm a little leery of people who've got everybody, else, everybody figured out. I'm a little bit of a skeptic. Forgive me, I, I just am. I hope you still love me. I'm not insecure, but I, I do hope you love me. You ever had people say to you, I just knew from the first time I met you. Really, you did? You did? I, I'm, I'm just not sure that I can always go there with them. My mom has claimed for a number of years now that she's completely responsible for Sherry and I being married. She takes all the credit. She says, oh yeah, that little Western girl, I just knew she was in the first time. And, and I'm thinking, mom, I was dating her for a couple months before I even showed you her picture. I was in Missouri, I drove home and I showed you her picture. How can you say you were on the leading edge? You hadn't even seen her picture. But my mother is absolutely convinced that she is responsible. And she's 86 years old, and I'm tired of fighting with her. <laughs> so, uh, okay. I knew from the first time I met you. I doubt it. Don't be a hater, but <laughs> I'm not. I, I love at first sight. First time I laid eyes on him. Oh. <laughs> first time I saw her, the first time ever I saw your face. Remember that song? Oh, oh, I just, I just, oh, 
I still can't. It's, it's kind of like, find a place to tie this thing up. It's the way that some of you feel about some of our music, I'm sure. Tie it up. Oh, I hear that song, though, the first time. Love at first sight. I know there's some people out there say, well, that's the way it was for us. And it's good. Live in it, walk in it, love it. I doubt it, though. <laughs> I don't know. I think we've all got a bit of the Monday morning quarterback in us, wishing that we could just pull that multi-million dollar quarterback aside and say, now, son, I knew you were going to get in trouble with, with that. But we don't. Just to benefit us, we need to look at what Jesus said. He said, you don't know where, you don't know where the wind blows from. Talking about all of your plans for tomorrow, you don't know where the wind comes from. We don't know. But he does. He sees us. He sees it all. You are, he says to Peter. Where do we start? We need to see things as they truly are. Jesus could see in Simon what Simon couldn't have seen in himself. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Jesus saw Simon in his fallen humanity, and we are all fallen. All of us are sinners having fallen short of the glory of God. All of us are broken until we experience his touch. All of us are flawed and all of us are lost and all of us are dying without God. The outer man is wasting away unless the inner man is being renewed day by day. We're in need of that resurrection life. None of us come to Jesus as anything less or anything more than a sinner in need of redemption a child in need of a father, a life in search of its purpose, its redeeming, transcendent purpose. We need help. It's a hard pill to swallow. One of the hardest, one of the hardest places to get somebody, especially in, in Western culture, to, it's a hard thing to get somebody to the point where they recognize, I have a need inside of me that cannot be filled except by something transcendent so far beyond me that I can't manipulate it, I can't earn it, I can't deserve it. That's a big, big leap for people. We come as sinners. Hard pill for, hard pill for the emerging generation for the iGen, we got a bunch of iGen back here. For millennials, there's quite a few millennials here. Whether you're millennial or iGen, it's a hard pill. Because they've been told all of their lives that they're awesome. Now, I got some, I got some uh, GI generation people and some builder generation people out there. You were raised and you weren't told you were awesome. You had to go discover that for yourself. But we had major shifts that took place. Don't blame the millennials and don't blame the, the iGen for that. They are, they are awesome, but in many cases, they're convinced they're awesome because we've convinced them. A millennial generation has a hard time recognizing that they are sinners in a culture that has told them, no, you're great just as you are. The more you learn to love yourself, the greater you're going to be. And then life happens. If studies are to be believed, millennials and I suffer absolutely no lack of self-confidence. Tom Rainier has done some incredible research. With, he asked millennials to respond to this statement, to respond to it. I believe I can do something great. I believe I can do something great. 96% of respondents said they agreed strongly or agreed somewhat with that statement. And statistically, 96% is incredible. I believe I can do something great. The word that we use, self-esteem, virtually unused 
in 1940, hardly appears in literature anywhere, in anywhere 1940, but 50 it shows up and then through the 60s it just explodes. It shows an increase in usage by more than 800% capping. It reaches the top of its usage in the 1990s just as the millennials are entering and, and exiting their high school years. And the whole movement in all of those years was to what? It was to encourage the child's self-esteem. Everybody gets a trophy. That's the one that we always kind of point to, but there are a thousand other ways that it was applied. So we had a generation rise up who had been told all of their lives that they are awesome. And, and the research just keeps, I mean, it, it just kind of keeps falling. Gene Twenge, who has, I think, done the, the best research you're going to find in the U.S. on emerging generations, she said among 29,000 college students, the average millennial college student in 2008 had a higher self-esteem than 63% of Gen X students in 1988. That's already after a large, large increase between the 1960s and the 1980s. By 2008, the most frequent self-esteem score for college students was 40, the highest possible score, and thus, perfect self-esteem. We did a great job in telling a generation that they were awesome. I'm not picking on, on millennials <laughs> or iGen. We made them. We bought them the technology that's helped shape them. And they're not the first generation to populate the face of the earth that thinks that they don't need God. Doesn't matter what generation you're from, we struggle here. Self-confidence isn't enough. And the research now is bearing that out also. In the face of record levels of student debt, economic uncertainties, and a failure to find the success they fully anticipated based on expectations of greatness, 75% of 25 to 33-year-olds report experiencing a quarter-life crisis revolving around purpose. Remember when, remember when uh, we started talking about midlife crisis? You ever hear people, those of you who are old enough to, to remember that? Do you, do you remember when people used to almost laugh at that? Midlife crisis, I'm not sure it's real. Well, the midlife crisis has been pushed down, pushed down, pushed down, pushed down, pushed down, and now a generation is experiencing, they are actually experiencing crisis in confidence between 25 and 33. It's a measurable phenomenon. Carolyn Beaton writing for Psychology Today in an article entitled The Quarter Life Crisis. She said, while later life crises typically encompass newfound anxieties aroused by the inevitability of death, quarter life crises revolve around frustration of a perceived lack of life. So midlife crisis was time is running out and I haven't got everything done that I want to get done. Quarter life crisis is saying, here I am living this life and it's not living up to my expectation. What do I do with that? And fasten your seatbelts, by the way. Research is stacking up on the generation that's emerging right now. We'll call them iGen. The continuing trend towards depression has, it hasn't accelerated. It has literally exploded to where, again, Twenge writes, they are at the forefront of the worst mental health crisis in decades with rates of teen depression and suicide skyrocketing since 2011 skyrocketing. Whitney Houston lit up the world with her spectacular voice and her signature song was The Greatest Love. Remember that phrase from The Greatest Love? Learning to love yourself is the greatest love at all and a generation sang along with it and nobody stopped to question it although the Bible clearly says greater love has no man than he lay down his life for his friends. Nobody bothered to question it. It was just a song. It was the anthem for an entire generation, an emerging generation. Houston was born in 63. By the time she hit the, the, the core of, of her effective record-selling years, she was singing to millennial children as they were growing up. 
I believe the children are our future. Make them strong. Help them lead the way. You know, show them all the beauty they possess inside. All of that is lovely. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's great. Kids need self-esteem. I'm right there with you. But when you take that to the point where you say learning to love yourself is the greatest love at all, love of all, you have completely missed. You have completely missed what life is all about. Because if it's all about yourself, it's a big story about nothing. For Whitney Houston, the story was underscored in such a tragic way. Loving yourself, you see, isn't the same as saving yourself. And she didn't, and she, she couldn't, and she died in a hotel bathtub at just under 50 from the effects of alcohol and drug abuse. I don't know about you, but it makes my heart sick. See, self-confidence is not salvation. Self-realization is not salvation. Self-confidence rarely sees reality. Jesus didn't say, Peter, you're awesome. He said, you're the son of John. I know exactly who you are. I know exactly who you are. See, he knows us. Jeremiah, he says to the prophet Jeremiah, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. Paul says, he writes to the Ephesians and he says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Nobody knows us like our creator and if we will be renewed, if we will be remade, if we will be restored, if we will be renovated, we're going to have to go to the one who holds the plans that are bigger than we are. The original one-off designer, the master, Jesus. See, God is a planner. He plans. We don't get anything done, really, without plans. This is a reflection, I think, of, of the Father. He's not reactionary. He's never surprised. He's never unaware. He's never unprepared. He sees what is. He sees what's coming. He sees what has been. He plans. His handiwork is design. Everywhere we see it, it's, it's designed. His universe is ordered. People get really excited about what Einstein said when Einstein said, God doesn't play dice with the universe. And people said, whoa, Einstein's had his evangelical moment. He didn't. He didn't. Einstein did not believe in a personal God. But what Einstein was saying was, I cannot look at this universe and buy into the idea of random. It's simply too orderly. He saw laws in the universe. He didn't take the step to look for the lawgiver or the one who set all things in motion. But he simply could not step away from the order of the universe. God questions Job. 38th chapter of Job, God questions him after he's about had enough of him. He says, where were you? When I laid out the foundation of the earth, tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched out the line upon it? God plans. He plans for you. You see, be with God, before a thing is decreed, it is seen. Let me illustrate it in a, in a secular way. Anybody here ever been to Walt Disney World? Just me. Okay. You can, you're allowed to nod. I got no hands. I got almost no response. Few murmurs. How many of you have been to the Magic Kingdom? Good. Put on your Mickey Mouse ears for a minute. Walt Disney World. I remember our family in Canada, growing up in Canada, we, because we had family in Florida and we knew what was going on down there with, with Disney World being, we, we saved and scrimped. I didn't, but my folks, they wanted to take us to Disney World. And I remember as a, as a boy of about 10 years old, the first time, the first time that I was at Disney World. I know I was older than that. I was 13. 
I was absolutely flabbergasted, blown away. Now we almost laugh when we look at the monorail and they talk about the future or tomorrow land and all of these places. I'm sure they've updated all that stuff. But back then, back then it was like, whoa. And when Epcot Center came along, over the, just over the rainbow. Walt Disney died in 1966, and it was years before Disney World was open. And when Disney World was open, somebody, somebody near the, the rostrum was heard to say, oh, I just wish Walt could have been here to see it. And Mike Vance, the creative director at that point at Disney, replied, he's credited anyways with this reply, I wish, I wish that Walt could have been here to see it, he said, he did see it. That's why it's here. Before it's decreed, it's seen. God doesn't just see you as you really are. He sees you as you really can be. He sees you for what he has made you to be. You are. That's just an honest assessment of, of present condition. You are, Simon, son of John. You shall be. This is an authoritative declaration of destiny. You'll never be able to build it, to shape it, to grasp it, to seize it, if you can't see it. And only God really can. He has to put that in us somehow. A sense of destiny. A sense of who we are. And why we were made. And he affirms it over and over when He's embraced and active in our lives, and that renewal is just taking place on a daily basis. This week, my conference table was covered up with flooring samples, paint chips, blueprints, descriptions and terms, cost estimates, and contracts. Around the table with the team, we talked about lighting uh, clouds and LEDs and friction coefficients. That was all new to me, friction coefficients. I now understand why I don't fall down on this floor. Trends and budgets. By far, though, the most helpful piece of paper that was put on the table for me were the renderings. They showed me a picture. Because they could talk all the way around the table and twice, and I couldn't understand where they were going. My staff knows this about me. Draw me a picture. Show me a picture. Go to the whiteboard and put up a map. And if I can see it, if I can see it, anyone else like that? Show me a picture and I can get there. Well, that's the way God works in our lives. That's the way he works in our lives. He wants to show us who we can be in Christ. May I suggest a simple prayer for you this week, all who seek renovation. Those of you who, you know who you are, you think. You're pretty sure that you know the mess and you're pretty certain that you've got a, a handle on what you are now. But you really struggle with who you can be, who you should be. And the fullness of God's plan in your life May I suggest a simple prayer to you, all who seek renovation? This one's not very, well, it is a spiritual prayer. I guess we shouldn't say that. It's, it doesn't sound like it, it's in the King James English, but it says simply this. Dear Jesus, can you pray that with me? Dear Jesus, draw me a picture. There you go. Dear Jesus, draw me a picture so that somehow I can see my life as you see it. So I can see my life moving according to your plan. Draw me a picture so I can understand like never before in my life why I'm here and what my life is for. Just draw me a picture. And you just may hear him whisper, I will. And while I'm drawing, why don't you read my book? Because you see, as God has revealed himself in his word, when we come to the place where we begin to recognize him there, it's almost like we develop eyes to see him everywhere. 
He will draw you a picture. Start with this word. Start with this word. God knows my struggle. And he sees it all. But he doesn't share it. Now, by that I mean he shares in my sufferings. But he sees the way out for me. We are surrounded by God's handiwork, by beauty, awe, and wonder, and we should expect nothing less in our lives if we're subject to the same hand. Yesterday, I had the privilege of taking a bicycle ride with two friends, and we decided rather than hammer time, we would just try and enjoy the ride. What a novel idea. It's brilliant. So rather than go out on the bike and just killing ourselves, we went out and said, just go and enjoy this. And boy, did we. Fairly early in the morning, it was still cool, and we got up into Rockingham County on some country roads. Very few cars, quiet and still. And you heard stuff you never hear. That the air was fresh. And the greens were, they're not the same greens and the shades that you see in the city. Everything was vivid and alive. And some of the old places that I'd passed before seemed to, well, they just seemed to almost step out. Went by an old store and it was like, I remember that place. From place to place to place to place. As we just opened our eyes we saw that we were surrounded by the handiwork, the genius of God. How can you see all that and not wonder that God has a plan for you? Equally beautiful, full of his wisdom and power. Last week I said renewal is first an act of surrender. He does the restoration, but only as we submit ourselves to his mastery. That takes trust. Last week we talked at the close about surrender. Today I want to just close by a moment on trust. Show me the pictures, Lord, we say. Lay out the blueprints. I believe he'll do that. But you can't do that and say, Lord, lay it all out and then I'll exercise final approval on the plan. That doesn't work with him. You can't retain that power. That's what the surrender part was all about. No, you come to him and you say, Lord, show me the way, show me the plan, unroll the blueprint and he asks this one question okay will you trust me even before you see it will you trust me